If you look at Angola and Mozambique, and certainly in South Africa, there were lessons to be learned there. And these young activists went over there seeking that kind of information to bring back to their struggle. Kwame Toure, Stokely Carmichael, had the same kind of intent with his travels to the continent. I was a part of that wave of young scholars and activists who began to go over to the continent in the late 60s. And then, oh, the second time I went over, I went to South Africa. I traveled to South Africa with Gordon Parks in 1986. We went to Siskai and Transkai in King Williamstown, where Steve Biko, we visited his grave site and everything, and hooked up with a number of people over there who were concerned and beginning to develop a more intense resolve stance, you know, against the apartheid regime. Remember, that's something that was installed back in 1948. It was something that the NAACP recognized even in those days when you had a Roy Wilkins and, and, and Thurgood Marshall and certainly A. Philip Randolph. All of these individuals were very much aware and conscious of what was going on, not only in Africa, but they had a kind of a global perspective and understand the necessity, you know, kind of, as Lloyd mentioned earlier, the kind of diaspora that we all got to get on the same page. It's got to be a global initiative. You know, the struggle that you're having is similar to the struggle we're having. And so we begin to join and combine that energy to fight off this kind of oppressive uh, societies that kind of start stuntifying and, and, and halting our progress and production as a people. So in the 1980s and the 1990s, one of the organizations that came into existence in 1977 that we cannot ignore is called TransAfrica. TransAfrica was put together by the CBC, the Congressional Black Caucus. And if you check out their mission, you can go online. But they have people like Randall Robinson. Hmm? Today, Danny Glover is the chair. Nicole Lee is the executive director there. Bill Fletcher before that. So we've had some very important thinkers, some people who with unimpeachable, unimpeachable integrity, you know, as a part of that organization. Those people who were being arrested outside, you know, of the consulate back in those days were all sent there, energized by TransAfrica. When you can see the, the elected officials, CBC officials, all with handcuffs, and concerned about the, about the nature of apartheid. You know, so Madiba at that time, of course, you know, you go back to 1962, and he'd been taken away from him, say, incarcerated. So the whole 27 years where he is not there on the front line, but he had his, he had a number of his cohorts who were on the ground continuing that struggle. When I traveled to, to, to Africa, for example, I went to Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, and you can go there in the capital there and walk up and down, George, every liberation movement you can think of had a headquarters there in Dar es Salaam. That's where you had the, even uh, the ANC was there, PAC, the Pan-African Congress, they had one there as well, to say not for Limo out of Mozambique, PAIGC out of Guinea-Bissau, the MPLA, FNLA, you need to all, out of uh, Angola, had organizations there. So it was an opportunity for us to find out, you know, what's going on on the continent by going to this outpost before African Americans were settled in Ghana, but then they had to shift over with the whole fall of Kwame and Kruma. Then Dar es Salaam became the kind of center where we can gather over there and begin to uh, have these conversations. The same kind of thing that Malcolm X had, he started in 1959 as a member of the Nation of Islam going to Africa. But by 1964, he made probably the most eventful year in his life. He made two trips to Africa. He spent like six months, a half a year, traveling in the African continent and in the Middle East. And he left, he left behind a very extensive diary about that. I'm um, hoping that in, maybe by March 6th or 7th, 
you'll have a, a little bit more information about that particular diary because I work with Malcolm's daughter, Ilyasa Shavaz, in getting that diary out. But it's in litigation now. It's similar to some of the trouble that's going on with the King family. Seem like can't seem to get their heads together and get on the same page of very important information that all of our people need. So after Trans Africa, the the kind of energizing, organizing, galvanizing demonstrations, you know, beginning to jam these corporations in there who had investments. The whole divestment movement, you know, was stimulated, you know, by Trans Africa. So that's an important phase of beginning to see how we can begin to knock down the draconian aspects, the sheer kind of oppressive society that was so much a part of South Africa. So you cannot forget you know, what, the, uh, what Danny Glover is doing now, and certainly what Randall Robinson did before. You know, Randall continues to have that same kind of concern about what's happening uh, down in the Caribbean. I went to South Africa to cover the elections. You know that by that time, Nelson Mandipa had been out, was it uh, February 11, 1990, and now we're moving into these elections in South Africa. So I approach three or four publications and say, I just got to get over there and cover these elections. I was able to convince two or three of them. They kind of pulled their nickels and dimes together and got me a ticket so I could get over there to Cape Town and cover those elections. Because we know that I had gotten that feeling when Nelson came over here. And if you read his book, A Long Walk to Freedom, he talks about what the U.S., and particularly what Harlem meant to him. He always wanted to get over here. You know, he was like an aspiring pugilist himself. He thought he could do a few things in the, in the ring and admired, idolized Joe Lewis. And at the same time, at the same time, you know, you're talking about Jackie Robinson, because he was certainly in, had the kind of a sports understanding to say nothing about the literary because the whole Harlem Renaissance period, the Langston Hughes, the James Baldwin, all of these things, all of these individuals from the African American community meant something to him. So when he came over and made that tour, you know, in the summer of 1990, I was right out there in the heart of Harlem. We had a, we were at 125th Street there, you know, and uh, and Seventh uh, or Adam Clay Powell Boulevard where he spoke there. And I can still see, because I was covering for the Amsterdam, Amsterdam News at that time, and on and the pictures I took, and you could see up there Dr. Betty Shabazz, you could see Mayor David Dinkins, you could see Daruba Ben Wahad, and of course Elombe, Elombe Brath, who had been, has been such a stalwart in, in making the African experience real for people in this part of the world. But they were up there on the stage, and I remember one of the things that he said, he was going to repeat it when, he, when, when Mandiba appeared at Yankee Stadium. He said that there is an unbreakable umbilical cord between Africans, right, and African Americans. An unbreakable umbilical cord. That was one of the things that resonated for me and, and brought it home. So I had all of these things in mind when I went over and to Cape Town in 1994 to cover the elections over, I believe you, April in South Africa. I thought it would be pretty warm, but it was chilly out there. It was cold, but you had people, believe me, gang, they had lines longer than the lines around the Apollo Theater in 1962-65, right? And one woman I interviewed, she was like in her 70s, 80s, and I asked her, I said, how long have you been out here? She said, well, just six hours. I say, well, my goodness, how long? He say, look here, I've been waiting my whole life for this. I can wait a little bit longer. And, and that was the general feeling and the climate we got, you know, from those folks who had been out there for the first time in a position to exercise their franchise, something that had been cut off for them for millenniums and millenniums. So one of the things about... 2001 and going to Durban and covering the World Conference Against Racism, always in, when I got back, we had that whole 9-11. I wasn't back a few hours before 9-11 happened. But the whole experience of being in Durban, South Africa at that time, with about 400 Ameri African Americans, we had traveled over there to participate and say something about the whole history of slavery 
You know, the whole question of reparations, we raised those issues while, while we were there. Very little was said about that. They certainly recognized the fact that maybe slavery was a crime against humanity, but you ain't getting no money. <laughs> so there's no reparations involved at all. Madiba's then spirit, there's no way in the world we could exhaust the kind of legacy that he represents and will represent for generations to come. You know, one of the books I brought with me is called Madiba that was done by a good friend of mine, Danny Schechter. And of course, you've got to see the film and, and you've got to understand that, thank you, that the, the film comes from uh, Madiba's book, Long Walk to Freedom. And I've been taking some of those long walks myself and understanding exactly what he means by that. But there's one word that resonates for me whenever I think about Mandiba, and that's Amandala, Amandala.